Kerbin seas and shipping lanes have come under threat, especially in the regions in and around Kerbin's Middle East. Qaddafi Kerman, a friend to the communists, has claimed as his territorial waters hundreds of additional kilometers beyond what is internationally recognized. A Seacan fleet, clearly in international waters, has come under threat from a couple of Qaddafi's MiG-23s. In response, a couple K-14 fighters have been sent to deal with the MiGs. This comes at a time when many other nations feel that they can challenge the militaries of the Central Kerbin Alliance network. This all comes at a time when one of Seacan's members had to retake one of their islands that had been invaded. This is Echo 3, and let's continue discussing the Cold War. Elsewhere in the Middle East, an ongoing war has threatened international shipping, with both sides targeting ships passing through the region. In response, the Alliance has sent a naval task force to the region. Unaware of the incoming missile, one of the Alliance's destroyers has been hit. Thus, the Central Kerbin Alliance network has been dragged further into this local conflict. In response, the Central Kerbin Alliance network will be sending even more air patrols into the region. On this occasion, a couple Alliance-made K-15 fighter jets are patrolling when they are encountered by enemy MiG-23s. In order to keep the skies and the seas safe in the region, the K-15s engage the MiGs. As the engagement begins, both sides prepare to scramble even more jets. The K-15s are armed with both radar-guided and heat-seeking missiles. The K-15s are newer and more advanced than the MiG-23s. The K-15s make quick work of the MiGs. Thus, the enemy pulls back its reinforcements when more K-15s show up to the fight. Elsewhere, a MUN satellite has detected something strange on the surface. It appears that a MUN quake has caused an anomaly near the edge of a crater. This strange anomaly warrants a return trip back to the MUN. Using some of the latest hardware and technology, the Central Kerbin Alliance Network puts together a new MUN lander. While this lander is smaller than previous ones that the Alliance has sent to the MUN, it is fitted with the latest in scientific instruments as well as it is capable of fitting in the Alliance's new shuttlecraft. The other purpose for the small design is that this craft is chocked full of Delta V and will be able to make three separate landings on the surface of the MUN. With the lander completed, it's time to fit it inside the cargo bay of the shuttle and finish assembling the rest of the full stack. The shuttle has been primarily designed to haul cargo into low Kerbin orbit. However, although it is not well known, it is capable of completing a trip to the MUN and back. Additional fuel is stored inside the payload bay. But even this is not enough fuel to reach low Kerbin orbit. For this, an external fuel tank is added to the belly of the shuttle. The additional fuel from the external fuel tank will be able to take the shuttle all the way to low MUN orbit. By adding this much fuel though to the rocket, its thrust to weight ratio will drop too much, it will need extra help getting into orbit. After setting up the fuel lines and the additional bracing to secure the fuel tank to the shuttle, a couple solid rocket boosters then will be added to the side of the external fuel tank. These large solid rocket motors will provide a lot of the thrust during the initial part of the ascent. Through the process though, the engineers have to be mindful of the center of thrust in relation to the center of mass. The main shuttle engines are angled slightly so that they will point towards the external fuel tank. Combined with their 10 degrees of gimbal range, they should be able to keep the rocket stable. An additional engine is being fitted to the back of the shuttle. This engine is vacuum optimized and should remain in line with the center of mass of the shuttle once the external tank is decoupled. The mod Kerbal Engineer displays a torque readout. This number should be as low as possible in order to keep the center of thrust mostly in line with the center of mass. Lastly, a couple solar panels are added to the shuttle. Shuttle Enterprise, you are go for launch! The shuttle blasts off the pad and quickly accelerates over 200 meters per second. Through the process, the shuttle continues to tilt towards the horizon. Jebediah Kerman is heading up this expedition, accompanied by three rookies. The thinking is that this MUN mission will be a great way for these rookie Kerbals to gain experience. With the solid rocket boosters jettisoned, the shuttle and its external tank will now make their way all the way to the MUN. With the shuttle now safely outside of the atmosphere, the payload bays are open and the solar panels deployed. Jibidai is now performing the orbital insertion burn. Once the craft reaches a stable orbit, Jebediah will begin plotting his maneuver out to the MUN. Looking at the Delta V readout, 
The shuttle still has plenty of fuel left in the external fuel tank in order to eject Kerbin and insert into orbit around the Moon. So far, everything is going according to plan. At full throttle, the engine seemed to cause the craft to wobble a little bit, so Jebediah has been making the burns around three-quarter or one-half throttle. With the ejection burn complete, Jebediah plots his orbital insertion burn around the Moon. The crew's orbit around the Moon is not perfectly around the equator. It is inclined a little bit. However, this is ideal given the nature of the different landing sites. This means that as the Moon rotates, the shuttle's orbit will cause it to pass over each of the landing sites. This first landing site has been visited by both the Central Kerbin Alliance Network and the Communists. Here, a small incident occurred when a Seacan Kerbal knot stole a golf club from a communist base. Famed communist Kerbal knot Yuri Kerbin was not very thrilled about the whole situation. As Jebediah approaches the arch, this does not appear to be the strange anomaly that was detected by the satellite. Nonetheless, Jebediah will get out and inspect the arch. While he is here, he will conduct as much science as possible anyway. While the arch is strange, it still looks exactly the same as the last time the sea can was here. Jebediah then uses his EVA pack and heads back to his lander. Once on board, he prepares to make a suborbital hop over to the next location. Based off the data from the satellite, this next location is most likely where the Munquake occurred. By just performing a suborbital hop, Jebediah will need a little less delta phi than he would if he were to achieve orbit first and try to land again. As Jebediah approaches, there is definitely something strange about this new location. There seems to be some kind of glow coming from the arch. Is that some kind of ring-like structure contained inside the arch? What do these symbols mean? And do all the arches have something inside of them? Jebediah says he's getting some strange readings, similar to when they tested a Kraken drive. The purpose of this ring structure is unclear, but it is a mystery that warrants further exploration. After visiting the third arch, Jebediah went back to the shuttle. The third arch looked very much like the first arch. Only the second arch had something exposed. Jebediah and the crew pondered the mystery of the arches on their trip back to the Kerbin. Now, as they enter the atmosphere, they must refocus again on piloting. The crew has come in a little too aggressively, and the excessive G-forces have caused them to pass out. Upon regaining consciousness, Jebediah pulls up and fires the engines in order to fly over the mountains. The shuttle has not been designed to lithobrake. With their altitude and speed restored, Jebediah now lines up with the runway. The shuttle has the added mass of the Mun lander inside, and Jebediah says that it is falling like a brick. Jebediah makes one final burn with the engines and is able to line up and touch down safely. But there's no time to celebrate. The communists are making a raid on the space center. Johnny Kerman must quickly scramble. The communists were listening in to the shuttle's communication and must think that there's some new Kraken Drive technology on board. Fortunately, the Central Kerman Alliance Network has developed an aircraft specifically designed for taking out waves of enemy vehicles. This slow-flying aircraft is heavily armored and heavily armed. It is capable of carrying a plethora of bombs and missiles, and jutting from the nose is a very special cannon. This is the Avenger Cannon, and it is able to spew out a 30 millimeter depleted uranium round, and the aircraft is able to carry laser-guided Hellfire missiles. The pilot merely needs to keep the laser on the target, and the missile will fly right towards it. And just like that, Johnny has already dispatched half of the enemy forces. The Space Center is very thankful to have Johnny around today. While the Communists, on the other hand, seem less than pleased. The re-emergence of Kraken technology has awakened Communist aggression towards Seacan. With the Central Kerbin Alliance Network involved in so many different conflicts around the globe, they are vulnerable to all-out Communist aggression. The Cold War is on the brink of going completely hot, and the Space Center may be left to fend for itself as the Communists seek more answers to the Kraken technology. What is the purpose of those Mun arches, and how do they fit in with Kraken technology? Answers need to come quickly, as the situation on Kerbin is deteriorating quickly. I 
am Echo3, and thanks for joining me to discuss the Cold War. I will see you next time.